let me just say on behalf of the team here, thank you to Syngenta for the invitation to uh, join hands and uh, harmonize this um, session towards uh, increasing understanding and awareness of nematodes and nematode issues, nematode problems and how to manage them uh, in general. So what I'd like to do is just say that this is uh, a session in, in order to raise awareness on nematode management together with Syngenta um, towards better understanding of them, of them as problems and, um, and what they are and how to deal with them, basically. We're going to focus on plant parasitic nematodes uh, and the diseases and the symptoms that they cause. And there's three, three of us here today from uh, IATA ECP NEM Africa, uh, myself, Solvig and Kanan, as Victor's explained. And um, we, we are both, um, we're all three of us employed by the IATA and the ECP. Myself and Kanan were employed by the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. And just as a brief background uh, to, the, to the Institute, it's one of the international centers for uh, agricultural research and to provide support to uh, national programs effectively. Our headquarters are in Nigeria. Uh, um, we have stations throughout Africa. So we work across Africa and our, we are based in Kenya. Uh, ISIPI is also an international, in, an international center for agricultural research focused primarily on insect physiology and ecology. Headquarters are here in Kenya and they have stations also in Ethiopia and Uganda. Um, and together, ACP and IITA have come together and we have a joint nematology lab uh, at the Kenyan campus, the ACP campus, where we share a joint facility. And so as a consequence, we referred to ourselves as NEM Africa. Um, and it's a, a nice ex, uh, example, really, of inter-institutional inter, inter, inter collaboration. <laughs> Don't say that after a few drinks. <laughs> uh, so we're based here, and the three of us are the international staff, and we have a team of about 30 staff, active members, actually, uh, staff, um, students, uh, interns. And so 30 people is quite a substantial number. And we, we had a retreat just a week or so ago and uh, it, ca it came home to us what a sizable group we are. And effectively, we are probably the largest active nematology unit uh, in Africa outside of South Africa, actually. So um, a force to be reckoned with in that respect. So we're happy today to um, present to you together with Syngenta, who we've joined hands with and are grateful for the collabor collaboration. Uh, but just to very briefly mention, we are international centers uh, we're here to promote uh, agricultural research and awareness and the well-being of farmers. Uh, and together with Syngenta, we are not here to promote Syngenta or to promote Syngenta products. We are here to promote, together with Syngenta, better awareness of nematodes, nematode problems, and how to deal with nematodes. So together with Syngenta, we would like to take this forward and uh, talk about nematodes today. Um, right, okay. Um, a nematode, it, it, we've got a typical nematode here, which is worm-like uh, and a pretty general example of a nematode. Okay. So in general, we'd like to ask you all what you think about nematodes as an issue. How many of you out there think nematodes are an issue in general? Um, and so we've got, um, oh, let me hand over to Liz here for the question. Yeah, so I've just launched the poll. So, so far, you've got 96% think they are an issue, which is good. Rapid. Good. Okay, rapid response team. Yeah, excellent. Well done, everybody. Yeah, yeah massive majority of 97%. So, for, just so you're aware, there'll be a few questions asked along the way, uh, primarily in uh, uh, Solvig's session, but a couple in, that, in my session. And uh, reacting quickly like that is very useful. So... Nematodes. Okay, we're going to focus on plant parasitic nematodes, but we want to put this in a wider perspective that nematodes are very diverse and affect uh, a large diversity of, uh, of the globe, basically, including people. People have their nematode parasites, as you see here. Guinea worm, many of you have probably heard of guinea worm. Guinea worm is a nematode. Uh, elephantiasis, a uh, long time back, I saw many people, a large number of people, stood on street corners actually with elephantiasis. Uh, fortunately, today, you don't see very many people affected by elephantiasis, but again, this is a nematode caused by a nematode, and very unpleasant one at that. 
Um, many of us treat our pets for worming with worming tablets. Again, nematodes. Fish have their own um, diversity of nematode parasites. And in our back garden, you'll find in your compost heap a whole realm of nematodes uh, working or decomposing your compost heap. Um, they are used as um, pollution indicators, indicators of pollution and environment. We find them in freshwater and we find them in the sea. And uh, a little bit more will be said by about that in by Canaan later on. And today, however, we are going to focus on plant parasitic nematodes as the focus of our talk, but in the wider realm of nematodes in general, just to increase your understanding, awareness, and knowledge of nematodes in general. All right, for those of you who are farmers, how many of you think you have a nematode problem on your farm? Do you have a nematode problem or a nematode a pest and causing damage to your crops? Oh, another big majority there, straight in. You're looking about nine, 90% majority saying yes, they do have an issue. Oh, but no is creeping up. Not by many. So 82% majority that yes, they do have a problem. Right. So if you don't think you have a problem, what we're going to do now is run through some um, symptoms of, uh, of nematodes and um, that may, may change your mind. So uh, meanwhile, uh, we want to address the problem, the issue with nematodes. And it tends to come with an element of mystery surrounding it. And so what we'd like to do is demystify the issue of nematodes in general, uh, and specifically uh, uh, for plant parasitic nematodes. Uh, many people haven't heard of them, or if they have, they're not aware of what they do or how they, make, how, how they damage crops, or in, for, in, for example, what to do about them. Uh, they are a neglected issue in general, even within the research spectrum, agricultural research spectrum. So we'd like to change that with uh, the audience and the participants that we have today. Okay, so just as a, a backdrop and just, to, knit, just to, to note that it's not always what you can see that matters. Sometimes it's what you cannot see and therefore it, we need to look beyond what we can see. Okay, so as a background to Africa, which is where we work and where we're based, um, Africa currently is in a situation where it really needs to increase its productivity and production of, of agricultural produce in order to feed its growing population. In order to do that, we really do need to intensify our production systems, crop production systems, uh, animal production systems as well, but we're looking at crops today, okay? However, there are of course, a number of um, systems that are already intensified. Uh, the export uh, protected uh, crop, protected crop systems, for example, uh, vegetable export production systems, as well as the floriculture business. They're all highly intensified and advanced. So with intensification, we can, we can tell you straight that with intensification, more intensified con conditions, there will be a greater importance of pests and diseases, greater incidence and greater damage by pests and diseases. And consequently, we need new, better, more improved pest management approaches to continuously deal with these pests and diseases as they arise, and uh, better ways of transferring these new uh, approaches to farmers. So the nematode, <clears throat> as, as previously mentioned, this is a typical worm-like uh, example of a nematode. The key feature here is the stylet, the feeding apparatus. Um, the stylet is used by the nematode to penetrate um, plant cells to extract the nutrients from in those plant cells and then move on to the next cell, damaging them and destroying them as they go along, as they feed along the, the plant tissue. Um, this is what they look like under a microscope at about 40 times magnification, for example. But the reality is, sorry, the reality is that there's a, a wide diversity of nematodes, just like there is dogs or cattle or sheep or people. Uh, there's a great diversity in size, shape, colour, etc. It's not just a straightforward worm-like um, structure. And in order to um, categorise these uh, different types, uh, one very useful mechanism is, is to divide them into feeding types. And there are two main feeding types, and this is useful, one for identification and diagnostics, but another is in terms of how we manage these nematodes and what approaches we need to take to manage them and control them. Uh, so we have ectoparasites. Um, 
Ectoparasitic feeders, they feed from outside of the root tissue. And here you have the nematode with its uh, stylet used to penetrate, and this is a rice root tip under the microscope, uh, penetrating the cells and extracting the uh, nutrients from in. Another type of nematode also feeding on a root tip. And nematodes tend to feed primarily, if they can anyway, uh, the root tips because that's where the softer tissue is and it's easier to penetrate and easier to extract the nutrients. And consequently, as they repeatedly effect, uh, feed on these root tips, they destroy the root tip and end up resulting in root systems that are stubby and lots of, lots of roots that are being produced and then, and then attacked, especially under heavy infestation. We also have endoparasites. Endoparasitic nematodes, they feed from within the roots or plant tissue. They enter the root. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a lesion nematode that had been stained red and with, is within the root tissue, and you can see the cells. Uh, they enter the root tissue, feed within the root, and migrate up and down as they feed, destroying and causing destruction to the root as they move along. Here's another endoparasitic migratory nematode. Uh, it retains its worm-like structure, and here you've got the eggs um, laid within the root tissue that hatch and then and, and then begin to feed and migrate through the root system. We also have sedentary endoparasites. These are nematodes that enter as a worm-like juvenile, the infective juvenile, such as root knot nematode. And here you can see them stained red within a, a tomato a root tip. They enter the root tip, uh, migrate within the root to a feeding site where they then become stable and establish themselves to feed from that position for the rest of their active life, which is about 30 days, certainly under tropical conditions. So they enter as a worm, they become sedentary, feed, and they develop into a swollen female that you can see here, in situ, in the, in the, inside the root. And here you can see the eggs from the egg mass um, exposed outside the root. So what we'd like to do now is just go through a, a number of symptoms of damage that root knot nematodes cause. Root knot nematodes are sedentary endoparasitic nematodes. They're probably the best known nematodes of all the plant parasitic. And they are certainly the most important uh, globally. Um, there are other nematodes and we'll come to that. But what we'd like to do is just give you an indication of the, the magnitude of the damage that they can cause um, and, um, and what, it, what it looks like and how it differs between different crops. So if you're producing root crops or tuber crops, the, the root or tuber is quite often damaged also. And here you've got yam, uh, parsnip and beetroot root tuber crops that are all damaged by root knot nematodes. So if you're producing a root and tuber crop, you, the farmer will see the damage because that is the product of the crop. So she's in carrots here, which is an, an extreme example, but this is a real example. And just to note that all these examples that we're showing today, they are from farmer's fields. They may be extreme. It doesn't mean to say that this is what we find all the time, but it gives an indication of the damage that they can cause. And they're all from farmer's fields. Okay, here we have celery. Um, Cowpea, soybean, cassava or manihop, uh, beans, this is from beans here in Mwea uh, in Kenya, uh, lettuce, banana, and you see here, here, you don't have the same knotted deformed structure like you have on tomato and celery, for example. Here, the banana roots are more swollen and globular as opposed to knotted and deformed. And here you can see a lot of um, uh, deterioration of the root systems. They've become necrotic and dead, in fact, as a consequence of, of the direct parasitism by nematodes on the roots. Uh, trees and woody roots are, are not immune either. Uh, this is guava, and this is caused by a particular species of nematode, uh, Meloidogynia enterolobii, which uh, infects the, the, even the woody, the hard woody structure of uh, tree roots. And these are the symptoms that first indicate that there's uh, a, a problem with the tree. And as you can see, it's not always that obvious. Here you have a slight yellowing and chlorosis of the leaves, which is an indication that there's something amiss, uh, a nutrient deficiency perhaps. And in this case, it's actually nematode damage to the root system. That of course reduces and prevents nutrient uptake or efficient nutrient uptake. So here on coffee, you can see the slight yellowing of the leaves at the end of the branches, maybe an indication of, of something amiss anyway, if not certainly nutrient deficiency. And when you look closely, well, okay, in more extreme cases, you see this. It could be due to a number of reasons, but one thing we want to point out is you can't rule out nematodes. And in fact, if you dig down under the coffee, you'll find roots that look like this. 
again, a different structure and, and format of uh, galling. You've got small bead-like galls forming on the roots. And here in closer uh, detail, what you can see is that the ends of the roots are, are, are uh, um, galled. But what you see in between is, is necrosis, deterioration, and eventual death of the root, which has an, a direct impact on the root system and its efficiency to uptake nutrients. So it's not just the deformation, they actually do deteriorate and die also. And this is an upended coffee bush, coffee tree uh, from here in Thika in Kenya. And as you can see, the farmer took this picture actually uh, and sent it to me. And um, you can see that this whole root ball basically is knotted, gnarled and uh, deformed and definitely not working in it in the way that it should be and definitely not efficient. And consequently, why the, um, the, the field was uprooted, no doubt, because it wasn't efficient. Now, um, often, <laughs> kick the table, uh, often people don't think that graminaceous or grass crops are affected by nematodes. Uh, this is a field of maize in South Africa taken by a colleague and a friend uh, who uh, informed me that this was directly related to root knot nematode damage in this maize field. So it's not poor germination or poor seed, it's not nitrogen fertilizer deficiency. This is a direct relation to nematodes. There's, undoubtedly, there's other things at play as well. Um, but one of the one of the reasons why we do, why nematodes aren't always seen as a problem on grass crops is you don't get that typical galling of the root system. And here you can see the root, uh, the maize root, with three female nematodes uh, embedded in the root system. No galling, just the three females, and, uh, and causing quite destruction in this particular case in this field. Uh, on rice. The rice root knot nematode causes distinctive hooking and curling of the root tips, which is gold at the end, but not the, the typical um, knotted galling that you see on tomato, very different. And here on wheat, you've got globular, um, small pearl-like um, galling on the root system. Um, okay, rarely do nematodes kill the plant. Uh, they lead to re reduced growth, sclerotic symptoms, stunted condition, uh, reduced yield, of course, uh, but rarely do they kill the plant unless they're combined and synergistic with something else, which we'll come back to later. But this was just an example of a plant that I found in this chili field, and we uprooted that and found this root system here, which as you can see from this is definitely not a root system that is being able to support the plant above it. It's uh, highly deformed, highly galled, um, highly deteriorated, and certainly not um, useful as a root system for a plant. Um, often, there's a gradual decline in production, uh, in size, in uh, vigor. And often, if you don't see um, uh, an infected crop next to an uninfected crop, you don't see the difference very clearly. Here, we've got rose plants side by side. and um, the, here you can see the root mass is, is quite knobbled and gold and not as clean and tidy as the one next to it on the left. Uh, slight stunting, but if you didn't have the one on the left next to it, you wouldn't really notice the difference. Um, and it, they were rose plants from Ethiopia. And if we take this to the field or to the greenhouse, uh, the, the tunnel, uh, you can see here uh, the tunnel on the left here in Ethiopia is heavily infested with root knot nematodes versus the clean and healthy tunnel uh, from Z-Way on the right. Um, okay, they're not side by side, but the pictures are, and you can see the difference very clearly, having a major impact. So here we have some chrysanthemum roots, also from Ethiopia, um, which are gold, different style of galling again, but you can see the deterioration of the root system, the necrosis and deterioration, uh, not very healthy. And quite often farmers rely on synthetic pesticides in order to treat this. Through, to, through a lack of awareness and through a lack of management knowledge. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to come from the soil either, the inoculum. Uh, nematodes can come through any, any form, such as the irrigation. And here we have a lavender from a, an, an, a soilless culture, a hydroponic system, again in Ethiopia, where you've got a lot of galling damage, a lot of reduction of the root system, deterioration of the root system from a purely hydroponic situation, no soil involved at all. And again, we'll come back to that later. Um, golf courses, turf, turf grasses, uh, they're important in, in a number of ways. Many of you might like your football, for example, and um, uh, turf is very important for football, as it is for golf courses. And uh, 
when you're paying a lot of money to go and see a football match or play golf on a golf course, you want nice, clean, healthy uh, situation. And uh, here we have a sit situation where you can just see slight chlorosis and uh, discoloration in the turf here, where the samples have been collected, uh, cores taken. And if you look under the microscope, you've got a reduced, deteriorated, rotten root system, effectively, and uh, which are clearly in under, uh, clearly um, affected by root knot nematodes, as you can see here, the root knot nematode. So root knot nematodes, they've got a wide diversity of crops uh, that they affect. Effectively, all crops that we produce are affected by root knot nematodes uh, in one way or another. They are not the only nematode, however, and as mentioned earlier, there's a whole diversity of different nematodes and nematode species, nematode types. Um, quickly, we'd just like to go through a few of the other ones that cause damage and give you an indication of them. An important aspect, however, is that um, certainly under tropical conditions, these different nematode species generally occur in combination in the same situation. So when you're looking at a management practice, you may have to consider management practices that take into consideration different nematode types with different feeding types. <clears throat> okay, different. this is a reniform nematode uh, that causes damage on that sweet potato amongst other crops. Um, I don't know if uh, you, you're aware or have seen this uh, before, if you ask a farmer about all this cracking, he or she will say that it's because of, of a lack of water, which it may well be, but we know for a fact that the reniform nematode is a direct, directly responsible for this kind of damage on sweet potato. Lesion nematodes, um, we saw them earlier, and here we have on rice, as you can see here, the rice root nematode, a lesion nematode, uh, is packed uh, the rice root is packed full of eggs and nematodes, which are obviously not functioning very effectively if they're full of nematodes. Lesion nematode on flowers, there's a whole range of damage that occur on flowers and flower industry. Anthurium in particular is affected by many of these. And in this particular example, you can see the root system that was heavily infected by lesion nematodes and quite damaged, rotten and ineffective. Um, secondary uh, infection does occur following nematode infection and feeding, and together they, they reduce the, uh, the root system. Bananas have a particular problem with lesion nematodes. Um, farmers may be very familiar, banana farmers may be familiar with the toppling of the banana plant, but not necessarily that it's caused by nematodes. Uh, lesion nematodes undermine the root system, the anchorage of the plant, and they fall over, especially when they've got a heavy bunch, a great loss to the farmer. This is the direct result of nematode feeding on the roots, which directly leads to banana toppling. And in the flower industry, lesion nematodes are quite damaging in particular. Um, and in, in this particular occasion, we were asked to have a look at it. It was heavily infested with lesion nematodes. And as you can see, it's very patchy and patchy growth. There's still flowers there, of course, and they're still producing flowers, but the heads are probably not quite as big. So there's a reduction in quality, but importantly, it's not able to be harvested all at one go. And it, 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 it interferes with the reliability of the harvest date, which has uh, important implications to, to the market, of course. Um, similar to root knot nematodes, cyst nematodes are sedentary endoparasitic and sedentary nematodes. Um, typical feature of them is that they, they swell into this ball-like uh, immature female, white immature females here. This is uh, sugar beet cyst nematode from Europe and uh, they cause they develop these cysts on the roots which harden and then lie in the soil for many years to come actually. And here an example of uh, potato cyst nematode uh, with all, all the nematodes attached to the root system. Uh, they reduce growth, vigor, height, yield, etc. Uh, as can be seen on this rice plant here, infected with cyst nematodes on the left versus a relatively less infected rice plant on the right. Similarly with cabbage, reduced growth production uh, and as well as reduction in growth and yield, uh, they also cause deformation of, in this case, carrots and root crops. But they're not, it's not always obvious. Uh, we've got this potato crop here, and I can tell you for a fact that this is heavily infested with potato cyst nematode. But if you look at this, um, it looks very healthy and lush and green and, um, and producing well. But it's not because it's infected with PCN. And back to what we said at the, uh, at the beginning is it's not always what you can see that is important, it's what you can't see. And what we can't see here is potato cyst nematode. It needs um, a trained eye, it needs uh, nematode experts in order to be able to assess that and provide advice and guidance to the farmer. 
but it is sometimes very evident, as you can see from this potato field here from uh, Kenangob here in uh, Kenya. And you can see in the middle, you've got a patch of yellowing, stunted, reduced vigor potato plants, uh, which, were, which were heavily, heavily infected with potato cyst nematode and leading to those <clears throat> uh, symptoms. And nematodes do not only affect the roots and tubers, however, they're also a, a pest and a problem of the aerial part of plants. And here we have um, uh, the uh, cockle ear nematode, which, put, which in this case on a wheat, they infect the stem, they cause distortion, deformation, and uh, infect the yield, the, the uh, in fact, the grains and reduce yield. Uh, and here we have a grain of, um, of wheat that has been soaked in water and the nematodes are all hatching. And as you can see, the wheat grain is full of nematodes spilling out into the water, which then infect the roots and then migrate up the stem and cause uh, a, and affect the aerial part of the plant. Similarly here on, uh, on rice, a dactylenchus causing deformation and crinkling of the leaves and reduced yield. Um, here on um, strawberry, we have apelanchoides, which causes um, damage to the leaf, uh, photosynthetic area, which reduces growth, but they also cause crinkling of the foliar leaves as well. So in other words, they basically just to demonstrate that it's not only roots that are affected, but also leaves and stems as well. The stem nematode, Datilenchus nematode, will infect uh, tubers, and this is a major problem in Europe, for example, and uh, a quarantine pest, in fact. Uh, causes quite a lot of damage to the tubers, as well as they can to the bulbs, uh, flower bulbs, in fact, in, in particular, as well as onions, garlic, etc. And they will cause deform deformation to the aerial part, which in this case is the flower head. Um, and not just restricted to uh, uh, annuals. Uh, here we have a, a plantation of co coconut, and uh, this is from Brazil. And if you look at the foreground, you've got pretty good growth of coconuts in the foreground with patchy uh, poor growth in the further ground close to the sea. And that I was informed was as a direct consequence of the red ring nematode uh, that infects the stem or the trunk rather, and reduces growth. And when you cut the, the trunk, you have this distinctive red ring leading to its name, the red ring nematode, which is quite destructive on palms. Right, that's just a whirlwind tour of symptoms and damage that nematodes can cause, all real examples from the field, although it's not necessarily always at that extreme, of course, you know, it's all uh, a range of, of levels of damage. What I would like to point out very quickly is that damage is quite often related to the interaction with other pests and diseases as well, in particular, um, uh, fungal diseases, pathogens, fungal and bacterial pathogens. So taking you back to the guava that we saw earlier on, this is an indication of the damage that was caused by a root knot nematode on, on the plant, on the roots, leading to a chlorosis uh, above. In extreme cases, this is what you can see. This is a field, a plantation of guava in Brazil that, as you can note, has been heavily affected, heavily chlorotic, and not looking in very good condition. The field next to it, look like this. So an even more advanced stage of uh, damage and the whole field is basically dead. Um, this is due to a consequence of the nematode, Melodigani and Terolobii, interacting with fusarium wilt. So the combination is lethal, basically. The nematode alone is damaging, the fungal pathogen alone is damaging, but together they form a lethal combination um, that is not restricted to guava, it's common across crops, uh, but is a direct consequence of the in, uh, infection with nematodes. So just very quickly, we'd like to overview the how nematodes can be important to growers. Of course, they reduce yield, which reduces revenue and cash return, basically. But sometimes farmers are not aware that yields are, are, are down to nematodes. You may be getting a reasonable yield, um, uh, but it might be reducing a bit you might see a little bit of chlorosis and uh, but without the knowledge of looking down below and finding roots that are damaged like this you, the farmer wouldn't know that it's a, as a direct consequence and result of nematode infection if they're producing root and tuber crops they will see the damage but if they're not they often are not aware that nematodes are resulting in the loss of the, the above ground crop they may see damage like this on banana uh, know that there's something to miss, but quite often this is put down to a strong wind, for example, 
or a poor soil level, soil fertility. But unbeknown to them, this is, this is a result of infection from nematodes directly. And of course, sometimes it's very evident and very severe, as in the combination with fungal uh, fusarium wilt and nematodes on guava. And another consequence of uh, nematode infection is the unreliability of the harvest date, uh, which has an effect on certainly uh, commercial cropping systems when you're not able to predict the, the, the harvest date as well. And of course, back to that root system that we, showed, that we saw earlier from uh, chilies, um, we've got what you would say an infected root system, which is an inefficient root system. It's, if it's infected with nematodes, it's inefficient. If it's as badly damaged as this, it's very inefficient. Inefficient root systems do not or are not able to access water as easily. So irrigation is required to a greater extent. You need more water to keep the crop growing. You need more fertilizer because the roots are not accessing the nutrients that it would normally be able to. And as a consequence of a poor root health, quite often you have greater infection and the incidence of foliar diseases and pests, in particular diseases, which may lead to a greater reliance or application of pesticides, which of course costs money, but which of course has a greater implication to environmental sustainability. So quick example of using potato from South Africa. This potato is infected with root knot nematode. Um, it's st there's still a potato there. Root knot nematodes will reduce the yield. So there's an immediate loss in terms of revenue. But the important aspect here is the quality. Um, with this uh, reduced quality, you, when, you need to peel it more. So you lose more of the potato once you peel it. But the quality inside, it becomes a little bit more corky, tougher, uh, not quite as palatable. But importantly for the um, uh, processing industry, for, chip, for crisps and chips, for example, you have a reduced quality and a um, an unpleasant appearance that consumers are not do not like. Uh, consequently, lay, the likes of Lay's, KFC, McDonald's, etc., they will reject potatoes as a consequence of this damage. And just as an example, this is from a few years ago, but from South Africa. And of all the reasons for rejecting mar rejecting potatoes at market nematode damage was the highest amongst all of them. So more potatoes were rejected as a consequence of nematode damage than for anything else. And closer to home, maintaining our link with potatoes. And we have the potato cyst nematode that was recently um, diagnosed as being pre present and prevalent here in Kenya and across the region probably. And highlighted on the front page of the national newspaper as being a crop been a pest that is likely to threaten an important crop here in the country. And this is just an example of how, in, how, damp, how, sorry, how high the infestation, infestation, infestation levels are on potato here in Kenya. This is an uprooted potato and all these white dots all around the root system are all potato cyst nematodes. But it's not just a loss of yield and loss of revenue to the farmer that is important. There's a whole range of reasons as we just pointed out. But another one is, if potatoes are not yielding very well, farmers are pushed to move into new areas. Here you have a, a potato field in the foreground and forest in the background. And here you can see what is exactly happening. This is the Abadurs here in Kenya. Forest is being deforested in, uh, uh, in order to plant potatoes because potatoes are yielding poorly and farmers move to new ground and new areas and open up new areas of land. So there's a sustainability an environmental sustainability issue also. Right, very quickly to recap and go over. Um, we live in Africa and we're working in Africa and it's supposed to be the uh, continent that's gonna be the most likely affected by climate change. It is expected to become drier and hotter and consequently water will become a more, more of an issue and more important. So the water that we do have, we need to use more efficiently. If if Crops are affected by nematodes, they have an inefficient root system and inefficiently utilize the available water. So by improving management of nematode pests, we improve the, uh, the efficiency of the increasingly scarcer water resources that we have. Uh, intensification of our cropping systems will intensify the nematode pest problem. So we need to be very cognizant and very aware of how these are affecting us in this way and how to manage them. Um, we're also living in a world where the, a fewer nematicides, 
We used to rely on chemical nematicides previously to control ma and manage nematodes, but most have been withdrawn from the market due to their toxicity. Uh, new nematicides are coming into the market, which we'll hear about, but we need better uh, options for managing, more sustainable options for managing our nematodes, whether it be the farmer, uh, the smallholder farmer, who is a subsistence farmer or one who produces more commercial crops for the market, or whether we be commercial intensified uh, producers of such as the flower market. Nematodes affect us all. In fact, each and every farmer across the board, across the spectrum, irrespective of which crop they produce. And on behalf of the NIM Africa team, I'd like to thank you for your attention and um, hope to engage in you further in discussion and with your questions and answers later on. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'd like to say, don't forget and remember that it's not what you're looking at. It's always what matters, it's what you see. And it's not always what you see that matters, it's what you don't see.